Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I am Brian David, Managing Director of the Lloyd Group, an East Coast-based uh, IT services, cybersecurity, and risk management firm. Um, Today's webinar, uh, I think, is is going to cover you know, two very important topics. Uh, we've broken them down uh, into two, you know, very specific buckets. First one is related to cyber insurance trends uh, in the market today, and that'll be presented by Doug Kreitzberg. Um, Doug has been a phenomenal business partner of the Lloyd Group and our clients. Um, he is also the founder and CEO of SeedPod Cyber, a cyber insurance managing general agency firm. Um, that Doug founded uh, back in 2021. Um, we're then going to pivot over to uh, essentials uh, with regards to cybersecurity and risk management as it pertains to helping you prepare for um, cyber insurance due diligence. Um, that'll be presented by Bill Golden, um, uh, our Director of Security and Risk Management at Lloyd. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Bill now for over 15 years. Um, he's a tremendous asset to Lloyd and our clients um, and is a regular speaker um, on cyber and risk trends in the IT managed services industry. A uh, couple of quick uh, housekeeping items. Um, this slide deck always ends up being a question that's asked at the end of webinars is whether or not the slide deck will be made available. We will send this out to, um, you know, to everyone, all attendees after the webinar today. Um, and then with regards to questions, um, uh, obviously, there's. Uh, I think we've left plenty of time based on the presentation and sort of our role play and kind of run through um, for questions at the end. Um, so we ask that you either hold those questions to the end um, or you can submit those via the chat. Um, we'll have people um, that are on the side that will be um, gathering all the questions throughout the presentation. Um, and as we get towards the end and get to the Q&A, um, we'll start bringing those out. Um, for us to review and for Bill and Doug to, to hopefully be able to answer your questions. We are recording this presentation just as an FYI. Um, and and uh, I think with that, um, Doug, I think we're, we're good to kick off. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thanks, Brian. Uh, really sh uh, appreciate the, the intro and, and certainly appreciate the partnership. As uh, Brian uh, mentioned, uh, I, I run uh, SeedPod Cyber. We're a an ins cyber insurance managing general agency. And, and basically what that means is, is that we have created a underwriting processes and, and strategies uh, uh, for a custom uh, insurance programs that we provide to clients of managed ser service providers, such as uh, uh, clients of, of the Lloyd Group. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on just defining what cyber insurance is. Some of you uh, may be well versed in it. Some of you may be wondering, you know, whether you should consider buying it for yourself. Uh, I'll give that at a very high level. I'll talk about the trends going on and why the, those trends are occurring in cyber insurance uh, today. Uh, talk a little bit about how you should approach approach, you know, the renewal of the policy if you happen to have a policy already, or or uh, applying for a policy for the first time. Uh, here. So, uh, but to begin with, just from a base level, cyber insurance protects uh, you, and, and, and we're really talking about businesses, your organization, uh, uh, from you know a compromise of your system that is uh, typically based uh, uh, due to to some type of a malicious or accidental uh, action uh, here. And uh, so, an example could be a data breach. You know, your system. Uh, uh, a bad guy gets into your system and uh, is able to expose data and uh, take data, uh, sell it or use it for whatever reasons. You may have heard some of that in the press over the past few years. Uh, a bad guy uh, could uh, uh, hold your system ransom. Uh, you may have heard of the term ransomware in which uh, your system is basically encrypted and you're prevented from accessing your system unless you pay uh, the bad guys uh, uh, ransomware. Uh, it could also be from the standpoint of uh, uh, someone uh, who misrepresents you if you happen to be the CEO, sends an email to your uh, uh, controller saying, I'm in a meeting, I need $50,000 to close this deal. And uh, you go ahead and wire the $50,000 only to find out 
that that wasn't your CEO. It was uh, someone uh, pretending to be a CEO. So those are examples of, of incidents that, that may give rise to a claim. Uh, and there are basically two types of claims. One are claims that are what are called third-party claims. That's when someone sues you. So as an example, in the data breach exam, uh, uh, situation, uh, if uh, an individual felt that they were hurt uh, uh, by the fact that their data was exposed, they could sue you. So that that's one aspect of what uh, cyber insurance would cover. The other is what are called first party costs. These are costs that you have to pay. Uh, and uh, really over time, that's been the majority of the, the claims that have occurred because a, a cyber attack on you creates uh, uh, costs in the, in the form of hiring forensics to understand what happened, to restoring the systems back to the state in the, which they were, or recreating data. Uh, and even uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the case of certain situations, to cover your lost profits or extra expense that occurs while you're unable to, to access your system. A ransomware attack, as an example, on average, uh, takes a business down for about 26 days. So that, that could be 26 days in which you're unable to perform business. You're, you're, not, you know, you're losing revenue, you're losing profits, and that's another area in which cyber insurance may be playing a role uh, here. Um, you know, a few years ago, and it, it was only a, up until about a few years ago, cyber insurance was relatively inexpensive and it was relatively easy to get. All you really needed to have was the name of your company, website, revenues, uh, perhaps whether or not you had a firewall and you were able to get a, a, a premium quote and, and coverage. Uh, things have changed since then uh, and in a, in a real dramatic way. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll, I'll kind of explain why. Um, really, the, the biggest change, the biggest driver in, in the change in cyber insurance has been from ransomware. Uh, and, uh, you know, data breaches were always around, and ransomware had been around for quite some time as well. But uh, really, uh, it really began to, to expand dramatically uh, around 2018. And you can see during you know, COVID and working from home uh, that it began uh, uh, growing even more. And, and what you're looking at here is really almost a, an illustration of the growth of ransomware. If I overlaid a, a graph of the ransomware, it would almost be the same as that red line. Uh, what these bars represent are uh, insurance premiums year by year. And the red line represents loss ratio. And the loss ratio is basically the percentage of claims uh, divided by the percentage of premium. Uh, so as the loss ratio goes up, that squeezes the carrier in terms of its uh, profitability. And uh, the loss ratios really uh, exploded uh, over, the, you know, from 18 to, to 20, uh, driven largely by uh, uh, ransomware. There's a 300% increase in claims. Uh, and then the carriers decided to do something about it. And what they did is what carriers typically do is they raised rates uh, and dr in dramatic fashion, uh, almost doubling the rates. You can see there was a 92% increase in premiums in one year. Uh, now that's across, across the board. Uh, and that did have an impact on loss ratio. It did go down slightly, you see that, but not to the extent that the claims continued to rise. And basically what that means is that we are still in an environment and in the foreseeable future we'll be in an environment where you know the the bad guys are going to be out there getting into our systems uh creating damage creating financial uh, hardships to to businesses and we're not just talking you know the targets and the home depots of the world the median size uh, uh organization that's been hit by ransomware has been hovering around 150 employees so we're talking you know small uh, medium sized businesses here uh who perhaps could not uh, uh sustain you know being down for a month or sustain the type of costs that are required to to uh, uh, uh be in business and uh, uh and from a carrier standpoint Carriers do a few things. I mentioned uh, raising rates, and that's one. If we go to the next slide, 
uh, talk about a few others. They, uh, in addition to raising rates, they may lower limits. So you may have had uh, $3 million in limits uh, last renewal, this renewal, they may say, hey, we're only going to write a million. Or you may have had $10 million if you were a larger company, $10 million in limits, and they say, no, we're, we're only going to write $5 million. They're trying to lower their exposure there. And some carriers decide they're going to exit. Some have exited cyber altogether, saying this isn't worth the headache and the hassle. We can't figure it out. And some have just chosen to exit certain types of of uh, market categories. So it could be uh, high risk uh, industries such as healthcare, financial services, or areas in which they've seen you know, large claims activity. The other thing that they've done, and if you go to the next slide, is they've, uh, they're paying more attention to actually what they're writing. You know, I mentioned before, four years ago or so, you, know, you, uh, you answered a few questions on an application now the applications are multiple pages long, and they may have supplements to them, and they're asking a lot of technical questions. Uh, and, uh, and, and these are things that are, are catching some insurance brokers by surprise and certainly catching businesses by surprise. Uh, and then, of course, they, they go and they ask uh, 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 organizations like the Lloyd Group to, to help them out. Um, I do want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about what are the carriers looking at We'll get into the technical controls, but there's a few other things, too, uh, that, that you should be aware of if we go to the next slide. And this, these are the factors, and, and they're, they're, there's a few others, certainly, but these are kind of the key factors that make up how a carrier thinks about a business uh, with regards to cyber insurance from a rating standpoint. They want to see a business. They look at the business stability, and the, and the biggest marker to that is is how long you've been in business. So the longer you've been in business, the more comfortable uh, that they're going to be with the risk. The types and volumes of data you have. If you have a lot of uh, uh, healthcare-related data, that's more risk because the, it's it's uh, very valuable. If if you're a bad guy to get a handle on on that. If you have obviously financial transactions, that's going to uh, be more risky. Uh, if you're dealing with a lot of businesses and you're not really uh, holding uh, any critical information with regards to the business, that's a better risk from their standpoint. Governance, how is, how is the organization viewing cyber risk? Do they have a cybersecurity policy? Do they have an individual either on board or, or that works uh, on their behalf uh, that, that's overseeing the security uh, that's important. The industry is is very important as well, uh, and and I mentioned healthcare and financial services typically on the riskier side of the aisle. Uh, retail could be as well, uh, but but that's another uh, uh, component. Revenue size is also a big determinant, and it's you typically the revenue size uh, is where the the rating begins from a carrier standpoint. So they use that as a proxy. The more revenues you have, the, uh, um, uh, the, the bigger the base rate will be in which the ultimate premium is calculated. And then the technical controls. Uh, and just if, if we go to the uh, – well, we'll go to, to that in a moment. But the technical controls are the reasons why your applications have gone from a page or two to nine to 20 pages. Uh, and they're what, you know, there are questions that are trying to answer or find out what you actually have within your uh, environment uh, uh, relating to cybersecurity and are you doing the right things? Um, you know, these, all these uh, areas, when you look at an application can, can feel daunting. And in fact, they, they can be, and the questions can be, uh, you know, tough to, to, uh, Really determine uh, what the right what they're asking because uh, it's not always in English. Uh, they, they, there may be a lot of insurance speak or, or even cybersecurity speak. Uh, the important thing is, though, when you're doing an application, is that you answer them as accurately as you can. And you know, and if you have questions about any uh, any uh, item on the application, you can go back to your broker or the carrier. Uh, to ask. What you don't want to do is misrepresent that something does exist and, and when it really does not, in fact, exist. And if we go to the next slide, there's one example, and this is an example that really uh, uh, occurred just a few months ago, uh, 
where a uh, uh, a an insured uh, had stated that they had multi-factor authentication over uh, their uh, sensitive data and sensitive assets, when in fact they only had multi-factor authentication on one type of asset, which was the firewall, and the insurance carrier, Travelers uh, in this case, uh, uh, w decided when presented with a ransomware claim by this client that they were going to rescind the policy, which doesn't even mean they're, – they're not just saying – we're not going to honor this claim because of this. They're going to say, if we would have known what you actually had, we wouldn't have even issued the policy in the first place. So you really need to be careful how you're answering these and, and just be honest. It's okay to add more uh, to, to the questions. Uh, and certainly you're going to want to, you know, talk to your IT department and or uh, the, uh, uh, the organizations that are managing your IT for you. Uh, and just from the standpoint, if I go to the next slide, uh, just want to hit on on some of the basics, and Bill is going to go into much more detail on, on this, so I won't spend a lot of time on these, but these are some of the things that you should have within your environment to, to make, you know, to ensure that you will be insurable uh, from, from an underwriting standpoint. You know, multi-factor authentication, I, I mentioned that. That is critical. That that's probably one of the the larger uh, items that the carriers are looking for. Uh, it can provide one of the best defenses uh, in a, for a number of uh, situations uh, here. So that that's certainly key. Having a backup solution, uh, you know, ransomware. I mentioned uh, the one way to get uh, get uh, without paying the bad guys is being able to restore your system. Well, you can't restore your system if you don't have uh, a backup uh, and you should be testing it on an ongoing basis. So that's critical. The firewalls I mentioned, that's a way that uh, uh, you, can, you can block people from entering into your environment or control who has access. Uh, you, know, you know, having more of a, a next generation antivirus solution, email filtering uh, uh, solutions, something called EDR or endpoint detection response, which is a way to, to kind of, you know, identify kind of anomalous behavior in your systems and prevent it hopefully from spreading out, outside of it. Uh, encryption, making sure that even if someone gets a hold of into your systems that they can't read it without uh, uh, having a, the, the right way to access it. Security awareness training and phishing simulations, uh, the, you know, uh, various studies show that the majority of the ways that uh, bad guys get access to the system is, is you know, through phishing or, or the, the human risk element uh, there. So uh, that, that's certainly critical. And having an incident response plan, a good solid one that you're testing on an ongoing basis. You know, even you, know, even you can have everything set up correctly, but the bad guys still may find a way in. So uh, being able to manage what happens after you are aware of that is uh, is something that is critical. So that that's kind of the components there. And, and uh, uh, I'm going to uh, flip it over to Bill, and he'll go into you know more detail with regards to what's really critical from a cybersecurity standpoint to have an effective risk management program. Bill, thanks, Doug. So. Uh, next, what we're going to talk about is kind of like the top five. So we, we're going to talk about it. We can go for a long time. Doug mentioned a lot of things, but I just want to talk about the top five that we're seeing um, essential for cyber ins insurance. So next slide. So the first thing I want to start off was, with is the written information security policy. Um, so one of the questions that we get is, do you have one? So why do they ask that? Um, if you have an information security policy, it kind of shows a, a, a different level of maturity. Um, management knows that security is a priority, um, that you've taken the time to actually document what your security policies are. Um, you're probably reviewing it on an ongoing basis, so they want to make sure that, hey, do you have it? When was the last time reviewed? Was it updated? You know, making sure management approves it. Um, and the last part of it is, is, does everyone in the company know about it? Has it been signed off? So it's great if you have a policy, but if you don't share it and people aren't aware of it, it, it doesn't make sense. So, and when we're talking about information security policies, there's three key things that everything we do or put in there should fall into. And this is called the, the CIA triad, triad for security. So it's confidentiality, uh, availability, 
and integrity. So everything we do in security has to fit in one of those um, three buckets. All right, next slide. So emails, uh, Doug mentioned phishing attacks coming in. This is probably the biggest uh, attack vector we're seeing. Um, so most likely on your questionnaires, they're like Doug said, they're getting stronger and they're getting there. They're looking at the details. They're asking, do you have something that scans for malicious links and attachments? Um, are you tagging external emails? So if you get an email, is it tagged saying, hey, this is from outside. So this is help from spoofing. So, you know, if you get an email from the CEO, but it has this weird banner that says, hey, it's from the external, you'll know it's an easy kind of marker for the uh, user to know that, hey, this is not legitimate email. Uh, next, SPF, DKIM, DMARC. Um, these are all things Doug mentioned. These are all security protocols. So at a very high level, uh, SPF is basically telling you, hey, these are my known senders. So if you're using a Mimecast or Proofpoint, Office 365, you can set up a list and saying, hey, these are the ones that can send uh, emails. DKIM is basically um, encrypting each message and putting like a digital signature on it. So you're saying, hey, this I sent this message, here's my signature, and if it matches up or if it gets changed, then you know there's something wrong. And DMARC is just kind of the combination of the two. Basically, you could set up policies to say, hey, if you if an email comes from my domain and it fails either DKIM or SPF, you can tell the receiving server to either quarantine it or reject it. So that's a big thing that's helping on spoofing is basically it gives it a little more control on your side of who can actually send emails and who's receiving them. Uh, interactive security training. So they want to make sure that you're training your staff and your employees on the latest trends, what to look out for, um, how to identify a phishing email, what to look for on a website, going through all these trainings. What is ransomware? You want to make sure that your staff is aware and your employees know what are the common um, security attacks going on. And then phishing email solutions, simulations. So basically you want to test. So if we're doing these trainings, the best thing to do is, is test. So send these out, um, send them out on a quarterly, monthly um, basis. So people can look at them and you could actually see your score go up or down. Hopefully it goes down with the, the training. So show that the security protocols and these things you're doing are showing effectiveness as the scores go down. So you want to make sure that you have these, and this is a huge section in the, um, the applications. All right, next. Identity and access management. So Doug mentioned MFA. Uh, so MFA is extremely important, uh, especially for remote access. Um, if you're trying to protect someone from getting in, you want to make sure you have multi-factor authentication. So if you have Office 365, um, they're giving that away for free, basically. It's part of the solution for Office 365. There's other things like Duo and Okta. Those are all super um, important. Uh, no local admin rights. So making sure that people can't just install things on their machines. Um, this is a question that comes up on almost every single questionnaire. Because um, if someone does get compromised, let's say it's going to happen, they're going to click on a link, they're going to try to download something, but if they don't have rights to install something, it, it's going to go a long way in preventing that attacker from moving uh, forward. Uh, privilege access uh, management. So. This is who has access to secure passwords. So if you have this, you want to make sure that it's audited, the passwords are changed. You want to make sure that you have something in there that controls your sensitive passwords, because if they get into that, they can get into uh, multiple systems in aware and move across your environment. Um, and strong password policy. This is the, the biggest thing going on. It used to be, you know, change a password every 90 days. They moved that to basically don't change your password, but make it really long. Um, they're actually getting rid of the word password. Um, a lot of things are going either password lists or passphrases. So basically you can have a, a password that's a string of four characters, uh, four words strung together. So it's longer, um, it's easier to remember, and you don't have to change it. Um, the longer the password is or passphrase, it's going to be harder for someone just to kind of brute force it and try to guess it. So. Next. So we talked a lot about um, the different security products, um, endpoint protection uh, platform, so we call it EPP. Um, so that's the combination of the next gen antivirus, which is basically getting rid of the signatures and waiting for signatures to download and install. Um, what that is, they're going to the cloud, they're checking them as they come in. 
um, every file to get information. Is it known? Is it bad? They'll stop that. And the combination of the EDR, which Doug mentioned, um, EDR is huge because what it does, it records kind of everything that's happening on a machine. So if you do get download a virus or malware, this will actually tell you exactly what files were touched, where it actually went from a, from an IP address, from internal, external, from the network, um, what it actually did. So if it's set up reg keys or set up files, that's extremely important to know when we're going through uh, an incident response because we need to know how did we clean this up? Did we get it all? Um, what did it affect? What in files did it encrypt? This will help us really kind of figure out how it happened, what happened, and give us a good, clear response on how to clean up. Um, another thing they're putting on there is web filtering and DNS protection. So basically blocking sites. So there's known bad sites out there. If we have a list and we can go through it and someone tries to go through and we can prevent them from actually going to the site, um, that's going to be huge because that'll help with the, like drive-by malware uh, things when people downloading things, it's going to block it. Um, penetration testing. So this is an important thing. We're putting in all these security controls, um, but are they effective? So they want to see at least a yearly uh, penetration test where you hire a third party uh, to come in and basically you give them your domain, you give them any external IPs that you have, and they'll do a two to three day kind of penetration test. They'll scan, look for holes. They'll actually try to get in. They'll test your password policies. They'll test if you have 2FA or not, and they're gonna try to get in. And then once they are in, they'll try to move around and let you know, so basically simulate a targeted attack. So this is uh, great. Uh, there, there's either two outcomes when I see these. It's either, hey, they didn't get in. Hey, good job. Or they got in and oh man, now we need to protect this thing. So um, it really is kind of eye opening in, in both situations. So um, next up is vulnerability management. So there's the vulnerabilities every day. You're reading the Microsoft releases patches every month, um, different vendors, firewall vendors, even the you know the two factor duo octa. They, everyone's has vulnerabilities. So what we try to do is make sure that you're aware of these vulnerabilities and managing them on an ongoing basis. So it's not like pen testing. They say once a year you're testing these things. This is something you want to do continuously is test internal and external so you know where you're vulnerable. So if you have a firewall that's vulnerable for like an SSL VPN, if you know about that, you could patch that before the bad actors can start attacking it. And the longer you don't know about it, you leave it open, you're exposed, the more time it gives it for a bad actor to try to get into it. Um, so next one is the SIM, a security information event management. So this is something that's been around for a while, but very helpful uh, when you need it in an incident response. So this is going to grab um, data from all different sorts. Um, so you can grab firewalls, switches, um, cloud things like Office 65. You can grab it from your uh, EPP devices. And what this does, it will correlate all that data into one centralized management. So if you have an incident, you can look at the time frames and see when th different things are happening, correlate those, and it really helps in the investigation portion of it. And also you can go back because once you have an incident, most likely they've been in there for a while. And if you don't have all these logs, you can't definitively say when they got in and how they got in and when did this all started. And that's extremely important when going through this to see where your kind of a, attack came from and how long they've been in there to really go through it. And the last one is, uh, do you have a 24 by 7 SOC reviewing alerts? So a lot of small business we deal with, you know, you don't need to have that IT team do it. There's outsourced parties uh, they can do, but if you have all these systems in place, you have your DNS filtering, you have your antivirus, your, your employee protection, you're blocking all these things, you're sending all those alerts. Um, someone needs to review those alerts um, continuously and really escalate. So if you have an outsourced SOC reviewing this, if they find out someone, hey, looks like we have some weird logins from Russia, they can call your IT department, they can take action and, and do this um, with it. So you've got to make sure that you have these things in place um, so you can address this um, almost close to real time or as quick as possible. Because the longer you wait, the more damage that can be done. Backups and resiliency. So Doug talked about this. Um, it, it's going to happen. You know, it's not it's not if it's it's when. So when it does happen, you want to make sure you're prepared. So do you have backups? If you have local infrastructure, do you have them off site? So in case there was ransomware, you know, we've seen it where there's ransomware, and then someone uh, encrypts the backup. So their backup system is encrypted. But if you have an air gapped off site 
um, backup, you can then restore. Um, are you backing up your SaaS applications? I don't know if this is a this is one that's coming up more and more. Uh, but if Office 365, that something happens, your OneDrive gets encrypted. You know, Microsoft has uh, backups for 30 days. Um, but if something else happened, like you don't have that, there's no off sites, there's no other things. So if you're using a Dropbox or Office 365, you want to make sure you have something to, to back them up. Are backups immutable? So that's what I just talked about. You have backups, but if your backups get encrypted, they basically do nothing for you. So immutable backups means that they, once the backups are taken, they cannot be changed, they cannot be edited, um, and they'll always be there. So when you have a backup system, you want to make sure that they are immutable. Um, so this way you're not in a time period where you get like encrypted backups and then you go to restore and you, you can't. Um, we talked about a little bit of DR and business continuity. Um, so if you have a DR plan, is it tested? How often do pe are people aware of it? And is it constantly being updated as you change, as people move to the cloud? You know, everything's in the cloud. What do we have? What if, you know, Office 5 is down? What would you do? Um, so you want to make sure you have these things. Um, and then Doug also talked about incident response. So it's great to have the policy. We got our incident response, but are you testing it? This is going through a, a tabletop exercise where you're going through a simulated, simulated um, attack basically, where someone runs it, you have people from different departments. This is not just a, an IT issue. Um, it's going to be because if your business is down, you're going to need different people from different sections of your business giving input, figuring out it's like, all right, well, we can't call our clients because they're all down or we can't email them. Can you call them? Do you have a backup system? How are you going to let people know what's going on? Um, so you want to make sure that you're going through and testing these um, policies and your DR plans uh, to make sure that when it does come up, you guys are available and you kind of know what to do and you're not um, going kind of frustrated. It's more of muscle memory saying, all right, we got this. Let's go through the plan. We've done this. Yes, let's call cyber insurance. Let's get them on the line. Let's lock this down. Let's bring up DR. So um, it's a lot easier than trying to figure it out on the go. If you kind of practice it like anything else, it's a lot better and smoother. So next. So those are basically the, the top five things that I've kind of narrowed it down to. So I guess next we could uh, open up to Q&A. Great. Uh, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Doug. Um, so a couple questions that came in um, actually prior to uh, to the webinar. Um, just um, and I think, Doug, this this is more related towards your field. Um, question about about being um, applications being cloud based. Um, you know, does the end, you know, does the company still need cyber insurance and, and, and what type uh, in terms of protection if the answer is yes? You're on mute, Doug. Um, so the, the short answer is, is uh, e yes, uh, even if you do have uh, and are working uh, exclusively in the in the cloud. Uh, there, uh, you you still should be considering cyber insurance. Uh, the data that you're putting into to the system is still data that that is uh, uh, you're a custodian for from your client's perspective. Uh, and if there is uh, uh, some type of action uh, against uh, that that compromises your data even if it's in a, a third party system, you can still be liable uh, to, from a law, lawsuit protection. And there's still going to be first party costs that you're going to incur in terms of trying to recreate that data or restore the systems. Uh, and hopefully you've done what Bill has uh, 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 indicated and you've actually backed up those cloud base and not assuming that just because they're in the cloud, you don't have to back up your data. Uh, so there are both the, the first party costs that you're still going to incur and there, there's still the potential liability that you have uh, in, in a situation in which even if, if all your data and all your systems are in the cloud. Great. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Bill, uh, you know, one one for you. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, you know recurring um, you know scheduled employee training with regards to phishing and things like that. Um, you know, when onboarding new employees, uh, what would you recommend as a best practice in terms of their training? So, would you recommend that they just they're in the cycle, whether that's a month out or or a few months out, based on you know what the cycle is at that individual company? 
or would you recommend immediate training for uh, you know for that employee when they're onboarding? Yeah, great question. Um, basically, you should do it before they even come on board and get access. Um, you know, one of the first things they do, they should look at the if you have an information security policy, they should be sending that off um, so they can read it, understand it, sign off, kind of just like an employee handbook. So. A lot of the times we're seeing these uh, kind of combined with the HR training um, that comes on the beginning. Um, so I would do that. And then also if you're doing security training, awareness training, that should definitely be one of the first things they do as well. So they should be auto enrolled in these things. So if you're a new employee, um, they should be auto enrolled in those things and then going into the uh, normal schedule for those. So then you can do the fishing and then go back into the annual. But as employees come on board, you should set an annual training program. And if you can do it, you can set it to auto enroll. So any new employee goes through there, it can scan it. You can automate a lot of this stuff. Um, but it should also be a checkbox for the HR and the onboarding team. It's like, hey, has this person got the handbook? Did they sign off on our information security policy? Did they do our security awareness training? Um, you know, making sure that all those are in there. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, Doug, this one's for you. So, I mean, it's kind of a, a sort of pretty big question. Um, you know, with regards to just in terms of how much, uh, you know, cyber insurance, you know, should someone buy, right? As as you're, you know, working through with this, this uh, scenario with someone, um, you know, making the best decision and understanding, you know, what, what makes the most sense for, for, you know, each individual business. Sure. Uh, it, and it is a it is a difficult question to have a one size fit all answer. <laughs> uh, the uh, I'll start on on the lower end. The minimums that that you should be considering would be a million dollars in uh, in liability in, in coverage. Uh, and and uh, uh, there's a couple reasons for that. One is the average, uh, and this is for small businesses, small medium sized businesses. The average cost for a ransomware incident is around two hundred and fifty six thousand uh, dollars as of last year, based on uh, data from a, a third party. Uh, and the average cost relating to the business interruption, that's the lost profits that would be associated with a ransomware around five hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So you add both those up and that gets you close to, to the million dollars. And that doesn't include coverage if, if someone decides to sue you. Uh, as a result of the incident, so we usually recommend that as a minimum. Uh, and and uh, certainly, as you you are you know as the the larger you are you are, the more you're going to want to look at at uh, in, increasing the limits beyond that. Uh, you know the uh, and if you're in a healthcare financial services uh, arena, you're going to want to look at at. Uh, 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 higher limits, e even if you're a small organization, because the chances of, uh, you know, compromise of that type of data becomes very expensive. It costs about $12 per record to just send out the credit monitoring, uh, you know, those data breach letters that we all get now, uh, and then we put somewhere because we've gotten so many of them. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, that's about $12 in, in, per Per record, and so that can get pretty expensive, even if you only have, you know, a couple thousand records. Uh, so you're going to want to factor that in in terms of the valuation. Uh, but you you want to work with a good uh, in, insurance uh, a broker or provider who really understands this space uh, and can help you uh, uh, specifically uh, get the right coverage for your needs. Great, thanks, Doug. Um, before I continue reading off, does it does anybody have any that, that's attending any have questions? Anybody want to chime in? Great. I think there's okay. some in the uh, Q and A section. I just saw one come in. One came in. Uh, yep, we got one from uh, looks like Adam. Um, I've heard of a few insurance companies requiring companies purchase technologies. On their approved vendor list, i.e., checkpoint for firewalls or CrowdStrike for EDR, is this commonplace or just unique to specific insurance providers? Um, I, I, I guess I can I can take that. It is uh, I, it's not commonplace uh, at at this point, uh, so it I, it it would be more unique uh, here. 
you, there are going to be, and I, I would have every, uh, you know, every business should be prepared to, to need to indicate what are, what tools are they using uh, for certain types of uh, capabilities, such as firewalls or uh, endpoint detection and response. And there may be a question if, if uh, what you put down for your solution isn't, uh, isn't one that the underwriter is aware of uh, there. But there, uh, to date, uh, you know, the, the concept of structured panel of, of providers isn't set. That may be more commonplace down down the road. Uh, we'll have to see how how the uh, uh, how this uh, type of insurance evolves. Yeah. Great, thanks, Doug. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Bill. Yeah, just a more a little more on that. Just what I'm seeing now is insurance. Like <laughs> two years ago, a year ago, they're like, "Do you have AV?" It was a yes or no. Now they're asking, "Do you have you know EDR?" And then they're giving a drop down. And uh, what my prediction is they're they're taking these things they're gathering that data and then they're going to base rates on who has the most you know if they had this you know and they got attacked and they had a claim they could record those to them provide those maybe in the future they do have um you know those approved vendor lists so but those are definitely i'm seeing more and more of them actually listing vendors on there than i have in the last you know last 12 months i've definitely seen that compared to Two years ago, there were there were no vendors at all on there. Um, there people, the insurance companies are definitely getting um, smarter. I think they got hit hard, and they're like, "Hey, we got to take action on this." And so um, the people that are asking questions, the questions are getting you know very pinpointed, and now they're even putting in uh, vendors. So great, uh, Adam. Did, was that were those answers uh, helpful? Any follow up on your question? assume silence is acceptance. Uh, moving on to Joe's question. Um, uh, basically, everyone needs to assume it's just a matter of when something happens versus if. Um, walking through each of the most likely scenarios and ask yourself, how quickly can I recover from that kind of incident? And what will it cost if I have to pay for help to remediate? So I think we covered some of that. Um, during this this process, uh, it, I guess Joe is is it just are you more um, ransomware? Or is that uh, just sort of walking through what that would look like if if it, by chance you had a ransomware attack, or are there other certain scenarios that you're thinking of as well? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks, Joe. Oh, okay, rather than typing. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, you know, most clients who haven't gone through an incident just have no clue how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost if they call in for outside help. And so I'm just wondering, you know, is there a way to to quantify for the audience, the, the end user audience? You know, if you have whatever, 50 employees, 100 employees, uh, and you have a, a ransomware incident that takes out all of your machines and all your servers and Maybe you have good backups that we can recover from. Is do you guys have like ballpark figures for how much time it takes to to recover? You know these small organizations because we obviously you know have experience doing it, but it's random, right? It's one day for some of them and one week for another one. Doug, you want to kick off? Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, based on um, uh, statistics, and this comes from an organization called Net Diligence, which uh, 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 focuses, works with uh, uh, almost all in, uh, cyber insurance carriers and gathers data and produces an annual report. Uh, you know, for a small, medium-sized organization, you know, the uh, uh, average cost of, an, of a ransomware incident is around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, as I mentioned, and the the business interruption costs would be around uh, five hundred and, and fifty or sixty thousand dollars. So, so that's you know what I usually talk to. Uh, there's another group uh, uh, that that publishes a quarterly uh, uh, report on ransomware statistics that says that the you know the average number of days that an organization is down is around 26 days and that that's been actually pretty consistent over the past uh several years uh there and and so 
those are some information that you know should should help you in terms of evaluating you know what what do at the minimum what do i really need to have uh with regards to to cyber and what bill mentioned uh which will help you even more succinctly is if you actually go through an instance response simulation and you walk through and you get a sense of you know oh we think we can get up in a day and then you realize that no you know it's going to take a little bit longer and and what do you do and how are you going to respond and and what costs you know those simulations can really help you in in a being prepared in in any number of ways including the financial way agreed okay thank you bill anything you want to add no, I was going to talk about the simulations and testing your backup. So if you're doing a disaster, you can do a full disaster. Can you bring it up? If you have a cloud solution, how long does that actually take? Um, you know, going through those and knowing those prior, that'll help me actually help make some of the business decisions um, while you're going through those incidents um, and get everyone on kind of the same page. Then you have some other people, if we're down X hours, it's going to cost us this much money. Um, and then you can more or less pinpoint it um, get a closer estimate for how it is your business because you like you said every business is is different but if you know how long you can you know worst case scenario how long do you get back up and you can run through those different scenarios basically what do you think is the most common one or um, likelihood of an attack happening to you if you run through those scenarios and go through the um, the process you can figure out how many days or hours um, you'll be down great um, question for for both of you uh, in terms of a cyber insurance policy, how often, Doug, should, should would you recommend um, that somebody's reviewing their policy on an ongoing basis and, and updating that policy? And then, uh, Bill, for you, just in terms of the written information security policy, same same question. Um, I, I think with the uh, with with your cyber in, insurance policy, uh, you know, in terms of terms of review, um, the it, it's a great question. Uh, uh, the The frequency of review should be certainly at minimum any time there is uh, some real structural changes in your organization. Uh, if you're acquiring a company or if you're expanding your business or if you're making changes to your system or you're, you're bringing third parties on uh, to help you in, in development of custom applications, uh, those are all uh, give rise should get rise to to reviewing your policy. I would say, at, and and at renewal, you should be reviewing your policy uh, uh, to to see how it compares with the changes in the types of coverage in the the wording. Uh, at minimum, I would really ask that you review your policy the first time you get it. Uh, I, we do a lot of policy reviews, and quite frankly, it's scary what people have uh, in terms of policies versus what they think they have. And and uh, it still is, as I call it, the wild west of of uh, coverage in terms that there isn't a standard language. Each each policy is different. Each carrier is different, and you really need to to be able to understand. What it is you're buying, and 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 again, work with someone who can help you through that. Great, Bill. Sure, for the information um, security policy, I would say at least annually, um, but you should be reviewing it um, kind of more often if you're, especially if you're going through some security initiatives. So if you're managing um, risk and you're going through and you're having quarterly meetings just about security and you're improving um, your posture, you wanna make sure. So if you're going through and you're like, oh wow, we don't have MFA, we're adding that, or you're adding conditional access to it, um, you add DNS filtering or you're upgrading your, your endpoint protection uh, platform, you should be updating your policy as you're updating your security posture, because you wanna keep that kind of up to date and making sure it's always aware. Because when you go through those things, and going through like a security assessment, you'll probably come out with a, a list of things. Hey, these are things we're not doing and you want to prioritize and start creating kind of a roadmap, a security roadmap of where you want to go um, because security is not like a, a set it and forget it anymore. Um, it's a constant, constantly improving and new ways are coming out. Things we're talking about today, we weren't talking about, you know, two years ago. Um, so you, you always want to 
kind of make sure you're you're on top of it. and people are aware, especially management. Usually it's like, hey, IT, and you want to bring it up because the business risk, these new things are coming out um, and these security things. You want to make sure everyone's on the same page, aware of the risk to the business. So this way you're constantly kind of improving your security posture. Great. Um, thank you, Bill. Um, Doug, saying with the same theme uh, around sort of events and timing of, of investments, uh, question I think very uh, that, that uh, for you is you know will a, a carrier deny a claim um, if you know the, the a question was answered on an application correctly based on the systems in place at that time um, but not everything was in place when an incident occurred. Um, the uh, uh, it's a it's a great question and that's where it becomes a, a little gray it, and it's the facts are really going to be determinative of how the carrier is going to to respond to that uh the uh if if it if they can you know as you know, when they start the forensic work and they they do see that all the controls were in place at, you know uh at at a certain period of time uh hopefully you know presumably around the application and they can validate that uh and then they look to see what you know what gave rise to the incident if it was the omission of a control that perhaps accidentally was was uh, you know uh, generated um, or, or re removed, or there was you know an additional staff member and certain certain things did not happen, they're going to most in, in I can't categorically say in all situations. In most situations, they're going to lean towards uh, offering coverage if it's viewed that certainly if it's viewed that. Hey, we had these things in place, and then we fired the MSP and we removed all the systems because we didn't want to spend all that. Uh, then uh, the, the carrier is going to take a, 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 a much harder, harder view of, of that. And then there's the, the kind of the in between, and it really comes to the nature of the incident and and what really occurred. But uh, like I said. Uh, uh, if if it's um, more on the accidental uh, kind of uh, uh, side, uh, that more often than not they're going to lean towards offering coverage uh, there because the litigation costs are going to be you know perhaps most likely higher uh, for them to try to uh, get out of it. Great, makes sense. Thanks, Doug. We have a couple more questions in Q and A. Uh, we got one from Dave Wallman. Dave, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, out of all the backups of SaaS applications, MFAs, et cetera, what is typically required to bind cyber insurance? Um, if, if the question is, you know, what do you have to have as minimum in order to get cyber insurance? Uh, I, I'm not sure if that if that was what the question was, but uh, uh, you know what what we've seen is at minimum you need to have you know, multi-factor authentication in place. You need to have the the backups uh, with uh, one offsite, and you should be have and with uh, data recovery, you should have uh, uh, a um, uh, some type of email filtering system in in place. Uh, security awareness training uh, in place, and more and more we're seeing the requirement for that endpoint detection and response uh, uh, there. Those are kind of, the, you know, at, at minimum, you know, that's what the organizations are, are looking for. I can tell you if you want to, you know, uh, many more carriers are looking, and it depends on the size of the organization, certainly, as, as well as uh, the type of industry they're in. Well, they'll start really requiring, uh, you know, some of those additional controls that we've talked about. Sure. I mean, saying you have MFA is kind of, um, you know, unclear. I mean, because, you know, MFA can cover one thing. It can cover everything. Um, so, so, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly to what extent these coverages are needed or looked at. Um, and similarly for offset backups, like what exactly needs to be back of offsite if everything is uh, in SaaS. And I, I know you said you know, SaaS applications need to be backed up, uh, but you would think that at least some of that onus would be on some of these providers. 
Yeah, they, from the MFA, it's a great question on the MFA, and that's going to be different from carrier to carrier and what they're looking at. Uh, Bill referenced, you know, uh, MFA for all uh, remote access and uh, uh, MFA uh, for uh, privileged accounts on both local and remote. Uh, and that's typically what you'll want to see, uh, what, what uh, the carriers will want to see. Uh, and from a backup standpoint, the, the concept of, um, they're, they're going to want to see that the, that the sensitive data is being backed up. Uh, uh, some argue that if I'm on OneDrive, I'm, you know, I'm backed up, uh, 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 but uh, they're, they're going to want to see that there are some ancillary solutions to that. Uh, they can still be uh, off-site. Uh, the carriers are still okay if they're still cloud-based, as long as they're separate from the uh, uh, the original data store. Thank you, Bill. I'll, I'll probably have some questions to you offline. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, Dave. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Uh, uh, so we have one last question from Adam Ship. Another question. I've talked to a few IT folks that actually got interviewed by underwriters after submitting their questionnaires when applying for cyber insurance. Will this become more common in your opinion? So, um, go ahead, Bill, do you wanna to touch on? Sure, I, I think as these questionnaires evolve, they're, they went from yes or no questions to multi-part questions with different vendors, um, and they're gonna go through these assessments. Um, I do a lot of work with clients where they work with banks and they go through this vendor due diligence questionnaires where there are 180 questions and then they you fill them out and there's like three rounds. They want screenshots. They want evidence. Um, I see this probably and I don't know, going door, towards that direction. Doug's nodding his head, so all right, he's agreeing. Um, where they're going to be taking, because they're basically taking the risk and, you know, filling out a form, you know, they want to make sure that you understand the questions, you're answering them truthfully, so they'll get on there and they'll actually change your answers. I've done it before where you go through and you're talking about something and they're like, well, you don't really have that. And they'll put a, a no um, to that. So, um, yes, they're, they're going to start doing this. I don't know how many are, what the, the trend is, but I, I've seen some of it come through um, and I think I think it's going to become more common in the next year or two. So, and I and I would uh, you know and, and obviously like every every other business there's, there's uh, cost trade offs on on um, you know doing something like this. Um, so if if you're in a hazardous industry and you're large, you're going to see if you haven't seen it uh, up to date up to now, you're going to see. It a lot more with it being more of an interview and a back and forth process. Uh, smaller companies and in, in industries that aren't as hazardous or with not a lot of data, it's going to be a, a, a different approach and not not as hands on. Uh, and certainly, uh, like in every industry, as as uh, you know, uh, machine learning, AI, kind of automated uh, uh, ways of of getting data and asking questions become more prevalent. In insurance as it is in other industries, you know, there'll be those type of tools that will kind of uh, be doing the querying as well. Right. Yeah. We're we're already seeing that with some clients where they're doing external scans and they're they're scanning their customers on a monthly basis saying, Hey, you got this thing, you better cover it up. So they're they're watching out for you as well. All right. Well, we're at four o'clock, so uh, I think it's time to, to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, thank you to Bill and Doug for um, the presentations. Very helpful. Um, and thanks to, um, you know, for all the questions that were submitted. Um, as discussed earlier, uh, we'll send out a follow-up email um, with a copy of the presentation and, of course, the contact information for Doug and Bill. Um, so if you have any other questions or want to follow up with them on anything that's going on within your business um, or additional questions about cyber insurance, uh, security, risk management, um, certainly reach out to them and I'm sure they'd be happy to help uh, answer any additional questions. So thanks again. Have a great afternoon um, and we'll be in touch.